It is a rather daunting task that I have been assigned or have uh, maybe foolishly agreed to to delve into. Daunting because uh, for several reasons. Number one, um, the topic of this talk, Scientism and Mythologies of Progress, um, could go on for, in each section, scientism, mythology, progress, could go on for days. And then the question of science and religion, their relationship or their perceived relationship in modern American and modern Western culture, uh, could go on for weeks and days, also days and weeks. And uh, the debates could go on and seem to have gone on um, for years and decades. Um, so for me to take a, a short presentation and try to hit on the, get to the essence of some of these things is indeed daunting. But, uh, having said all that, um, we can't just say it's complicated and leave it at that because um, these questions are, are at the forefront uh, uh, in modern culture. Um, they are ever present in the press. Um, every new, every day, every week, every month, we see something in the press about a scientific discovery, and a scientist or a non-scientist, sometimes one of each, claiming its uh, meaning or, or importance in relationship to religion. Uh, and we are in a position where, as Orthodox, um, if we're speaking to an Orthodox audience, um, we have a, a number of issues because what is meant by religion uh, is... Uh, going to be something different in some ways. Religion and theology, when we, when we speak about it in a Western sense or an Eastern sense. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we have the problem where sometimes we don't know or we can't tell where the scientist is speaking qua scientist and then as philosopher. And this is one of the other things that I think it's important to, for me to start out by pointing to, is that the authority, um, the cultural authority, of the credentialed scientist, well, the credentialed expert, period, but the credentialed scientist, uh, that uh, cultural authority, uh, especially in the late 19th and through the early mid 20th century, uh, accrued great, um, great power. And some have, 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 some historians and others have said, in a way, the scientist, uh, or the, the generic scientist, whoever he or she may be, has taken on the role of the, the high priest of uh, how moderners are to understand uh, the world around them, not only in empirical senses, not only in terms of what we, the, the, our, our sensory analysis of the world, but in the cosmic senses. Um, and so we have a problem where when we look at, when a scientist speaks, as people who grow up in, the, in modern society, we naturally see, uh, we've been sort of, given that idea about the scientist's role, and we respect that, and in some ways we should respect it, but we also have to be sure we can tell the difference between when the scientist is speaking about science and speaking about things that are not science and also are not susceptible to scientific analysis, uh, or are not at least properly, fully understood through the lenses of scientific analysis. So, having laid out those problems, um, listening to scientists speaking and knowing where to draw the line when we listen, uh, and also just the, the overabundance of uh, uh, scientific authority. And then the final thing I should mention, of course, is the so-called conflict or warfare between science and religion, um, that we are oft uh, given uh, uh, reminders of, uh, supposedly, the conflict between science and religion. So, uh, I'm going to hit on a few points today that will hopefully give us some introductory ways, just introductory ways to look at the questions and be able to look at, uh, list, look and listen to what we are being told and to draw some distinctions <coughs> that are not obvious uh, because they're not laid out for us, but distinctions between what is science and what is something else uh, when we are spoken to by authorities, be they scientists or, or others. So. Uh, I'd like to begin with a quote from one of my uh, favorite uh, authors, probably my favorite author, but also uh, one of my uh, three favorite of his books, uh, 
probably some of you in the audience here, if not many of you, recognize this, this uh, author, Fyodor Dostoevsky. And the, uh, the quote is from his 1873 novel, uh, Demons, uh, The Possessed, often translated. And Dostoevsky says in one part of this uh, book, uh, his, uh, the narrator says, half science, half science, the most terrible scourge of mankind, worse than plague, hunger, or war, unknown till our century, of course he means the 19th century, this is the part that's very interesting, too. Half science is a despot, such as has never been seen before. A despot with its own priests and slaves. A despot before whom everything has bowed down with a love and superstition unthinkable till now. Now, I think it's important for us to notice right in the beginning this term, half science. Because Dostoevsky is not saying science is a scourge of mankind, but half science. Now, without going into the context of Dostoevsky's personal experience or Russian society at the time, uh, we do know, I will say one thing, and if I'm repeating things you already know, forgive me here, but we know that Dostoevsky uh, is experiencing a, a, a social, some uh, social trends that are going to lead to great problems. And he sees them, he sees this prophetically, uh, and he, he sees that uh, even the ideologies, the political ideologies that are uh, going to be offered, are being offered, and are going to be bought into by very many people uh, in his world, um, have a deceptiveness to them because they, uh, they purport to have a sort of scientific, or empirical, or unquestionable backing to them. And if we think about um, Dostoevsky's exact context in Russia, we think about uh, the influence of, of Feuerbach uh, and, uh, of course, how Marx, Karl Marx, will eventually take this, the ideas of Feuerbach and sort of turn them upside down, but make that uh, a dominant idea in Russia. And we should remember that the idea is advertised as scientific, that this is a scientific analysis of society. That society, uh, we have now seen, or we now know, is traceable, is uh, mappable completely by understanding the, the, these, these larger laws that drive human uh, behavior, human choice, and social development. And because we know what they are, we can master them and thus manipulate them for the human good. Because the, the idea is that this is for, for the human good. And so the question of mastery of nature uh, by understanding these, these, these laws that are as clear as the laws of 2 plus 2, as mathematical laws, uh, if uh, it, could be a very uh, it could be a very dangerously seductive idea if we take the first premise, which is, that society can be reduced to absolute laws. Human behavior can be reduced to absolute laws uh, that are <clears throat> determining human behavior rather than accepting the reality of free choice, which free will cannot be reduced to absolutes. Right? And so free will, at the essence of uh, Eastern Orthodox um, theological vision and the anthropological, the, anth the human anthropology, uh, is a problem for the perspective of somebody who wants to reduce everything to mappable laws. Right? So, having said that, and having pointed out this, 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 this perception that Dostoevsky has, uh, I want us to think about what he might mean by half science. Okay, and think about what he might mean by half science. Because Dostoevsky was also very much uh, knowledgeable about Western thought. So today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is a couple, or a couple of... Uh, key pieces, I think, in our uh, ability to start to understand or think about what that half science might be, what it might mean. And remember that when the, in the, what I mentioned a moment ago about Feuerbach and Marx, that the idea is that society is on, is on, can be improved by understanding and manipulating the laws that are irrefutable and are directing and driving human society. Uh, if you're going to direct human society, 
The idea is you're going to make it better. Right? So this question here, progress. Uh, progress as an idea, capital P progress, not small p, but capital P, as an ideology, is um, an outgrowth uh, of uh, what is often termed the, the Enlightenment in Western Europe, although we'll talk about that in a little bit in a little while. But it is uh, understood to be an outgrowth of the Enlightenment and um, that it is something new and never before seen. That this idea, the Enlightenment being a European uh, intellectual movement that uh, would probably date it to the 17th and 18th century, uh, that this progress was sort of the, 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 the centerpiece, uh, the idea of human <clears throat> progress. So we're going to talk about this. What does progress mean at the time? What is this idea? And, and what is so appealing about it? And then we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean in the 20th century and now. Because in the 20th century, there is a movement in, in the West, but also in the United States. It's very prominent in the United States. It's called the Progressive Movement. What is the Progressive Movement? And then what do we mean by the word progress now? Or when people use the term progressive, I'm a progressive. He's a progressive. This idea is progressive. Or this is not progressive. What does this mean? Now, I don't know how much we'll get into the last part, but it's something to think about. Okay? These ideas, or these words and uses of progressive, are not unrelated to this earlier conception. Okay? And then, what is science? When we say that something is scientific, or when, when Feuerbach and then Marx and, uh, talk about society and said we can map things in society and say that we're going to do it scientifically, or from the perspective of laboratory science. What is going on in laboratory science? Right? And how do people try to make that connection that laboratory science and the science of human social development is a connection? What do we mean by all that? And I think the way to first go after that is to ask the question, what do we mean by the word science? Uh, and is it the same uh, over time? Um, and what is the difference between science and scientism? Which is part of the, one of the two key words in my, in my title of my talk, scientism as opposed to science. What is it? Uh, what's the difference? Is it scientific? Okay. It has the word science in, in, right in the, in, embedded in it. But is scientism science? Okay. And then, uh, finally, what about uh, in, in talking about science, uh, or in talking about the science of laboratory science, or the idea of science in society, or a scientific analysis of society, what are the methods? All right. What are the methods that are being purported um, for uh, what science is supposed to do? What is, how you do it, and what is it supposed to accomplish? What are we seeking to do with science? And at the end here, I have this, this idea of we're going to try out what we've learned here and see at the end if we can take a little sample of something that I think um, we might read differently uh, if we have some of the, the ideas in mind that we're going to go over. Okay, So this is kind of a haphazard, uh, I have a little asterisk there to show what, these are topics, so that, this is what I'm going to do today, okay? Um, hit on this, hit on this, and hit on the methods of science, and are they the same over time, and then we'll see if we can apply this to a little case study. What is science? What is scientism? Okay, I have a slide all alone for that, because I want you to uh, think and, and, and realize that these are two very different things. So, the question would be, I think, to start, what is science? What do we think science is now? How is science defined now? Okay. Uh, believe it or not, there have been numerous uh, philosophers who have attempted to, of, of science, who have tried to define science in a way that narrows it enough to say this is some particular set of ideas or practices, but not so uh, broad uh, not so narrow that it excludes the different sciences, physics, biology, chemistry, uh, but also not so broad that it doesn't say anything at all. And it's surprisingly difficult. Um, it's surprisingly difficult, but that does not stop uh, people from, um, from being seeming quite sure that they know what it, what it is when they speak about it um, in, in, cult, in broad sense. Uh, what is scientism? All right, let's talk about science first. I would posit, for the purposes of our discussion today, a very simple definition of science. Uh, and I would pre uh, 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 sort of preface it by saying there's no such thing. Okay? There's no such thing as science per se. 
Uh, I am not completely uh, on, off the deep end on this because uh, this is something that historians and philosophers of science have, have uh, I think, rather persuasively argued in recent years. There's no such thing as science per se because science is not a single thing at all. Right? Science is not a single thing. It's a set of things that share a couple of methods. But when we say science, relationship of science to X, Y, Z, well, what does that mean? Well, let's take a couple of the, of the uh, natural sciences. Okay? Uh, let's, for example, say biology or chemistry. But biology and chemistry, I think, in, in, in their individual scientific approaches, share one thing in common. The, the faith in empirical observation. Okay? We observe with our senses, uh, and if it be through the, uh, the uh, use of microscopes or, or, or instruments to see uh, distance, uh, biology and chemistry to see things very small, to see things uh, as whole systems, uh, human body, animal body, the, the method is what, is what ties them together. Uh, the observation and the, what we call empiricism, the empirical observation. And then what we do with the, with the observations. The conclusions that we attempt to, to draw from them, again, that are purely centered on what we can observe. Right? Our conclusions must be based on what we observe, uh, just as much as that's the only evidence we have. We're going to study something no matter how small and how, how much detail. We only are seeing what we're seeing. All right, so biology and chemistry uh, uh, use observation. And then they move to a hypothesis about what we might be seeing and how it might be working. And then test the hypothesis and try to come up with conclusions. But the key thing that I think unites this, really, is the observational method and the conclusion and test based on observation. However, Physics, I don't think anybody would deny, is a science. Uh, but physics, for example, and uh, especially increasingly mod modern physics, quantum physics, and, 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 and uh, studies of, of, the physic of what we call physics, mathematical physics, involve things that we cannot see and cannot observe. Uh, uh, sound, light, uh, light uh, waves that are in infrared. Okay? We can track them by using instruments that say, well, there's something there. But we cannot observe it uh, in the same way as we observe things in chemistry and biology. So there is the, there is, we could observe maybe the absence of something or something so small that we can't see and say, well, it's there by what we, we can kind of see the, the reverberations of it or see by the reactions of, of things around it that we can observe that there's something in there. But, but we can't see the thing itself. Well, if we can't see the thing itself, then it's very difficult to say that this is exactly the same pursuit as chemistry or biology, for example, or astronomy, or uh, sciences that we do actually observe the thing we're talking about. Right? Um, and so if that's the case, then if empiricism and observation is, the, is at least the, 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 the basis of what we would call science or natural science, and we can't see some of the things that we, in, in disciplines that we call science, we have to step back and think, what does science, the word science mean? Is it overly generalized? And I think it probably is. Um, it's, not, it's not that there's no such thing as the sciences, but there's no such thing as this absolute umbrella term that overarches everything that you can lump all things that are pursued, all disciplines that are pursued under the name of science as being a single thing. If we know that this is true, then we would be careful immediately in saying there is a relationship between science and anything. What does science, how does science relate to anything? X, Y, Z. Right? Uh, well, I don't know if it, there's any way of answering that question because the question is, 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 is a little bit flawed. Now, scientism, having said that, okay, I believe firmly in the, in the, in the disciplines of science uh, in terms of observation and their usefulness. But drawing, but we have to, I think, make sure that we understand what the limits are. And the limits are determined by the methods. Okay? Now, if we have to then define limits to what science is, 
and we should be careful to define the different kinds of limits between the different sciences, uh, then we would ask, invite a humility, a bit of a humility, uh, to, uh, on claims, that general claims we're going to make about uh, on the basis of this supposed overarching idea. And I've already said that. But scientism, I repeat what I said, because scientism is something that uh, assumes an absolute singular entity called science. There's not the sciences, it's science. And science does this, or science relates to other aspects of culture in this way. Okay? Uh, now, scientism has been defined by various philosophers of science, and it may surprise people to think about this, but science is a branch of philosophy in a way, because it has limits that are defined by human, the human mind that says we, that's what makes it science versus what isn't science. So there are boundaries in science. Okay? Well, uh, if, if there are boundaries, there are ideas that people uh, who practice these sciences agree to. So there's a philosophy behind science. And so the philosophers of science who have talked about scientism, uh, some of them uh, have offered some suggestions about how we might define it. One, is, one definition by a uh, philosopher of science named Joseph Agassi, uh, has a recent philosopher of science, says that scientism is a posture found in culture where the scientific method is conceived as so all-encompassing, so all-encompassing that it can be effectively employed to answer all of life's pertinent questions. Right? So this method, that even though we know it does differ in some ways between how it's practiced in physics or biology or chemistry, this method the observational method, I guess, the hypothesis testing method, except the observation we can't really do in the same way, but okay, let's paper everything over and say, well, there's a, there's a method that is basically at least I ideally the same, but that this method has been so successful in, in observing and drawing conclusions from the physical world that we could apply it to everything. It's a kind of an infallible method of getting to the essence of things. And scientism is a philosophy of the world that is based upon this belief. That scientism is a posture, I repeat, where the scientific method is conceived as so all-encompassing that it can be effectively employed to answer all of life's per pertinent questions. The trouble with scientism is, and the Gazi goes on, uh, is that it encourages an unquestioning acceptance of anything framed as scientific, provided that is offered by the properly credentialed authorities. So, scientism, uh, takes our high priests of, 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 the, of the world, sort of our new professional high priests, and says, well, if they say it, it must be the case. Right? Because they are scientists, and they are masters of this, this method. Okay? But Agassi goes on and points out some problems with scientism, which is a fairly prevalent view, and sometimes unconsciously, is that it, it, it assumes a couple of two things very important. That science or can be the sole part of culture that matters, intellectually, and <laughs> that it demands an obedience, an obedience and a faithfulness, a, a, an almost evangelical faithfulness, such that it destroys open debate. Well, if the authority says this, and he's a professor of so-and-so, then, and he's a scientific thinker, and he's talking about the cosmos, then who am I to possibly even ask, uh, you know, what's going on here? Okay. And, and the, the next, uh, the last piece of the puzzle that becomes a problem is if it demands a kind of obedience to an authority figure who is master of a method that the laity are not masters of, it destroys open debate. But open debate is the very essence of science. Right? Because it's scientists make an observation. People who practice science legitimately observe whatever their way they're observing, but physics, however the, the, the little different variations, but they observe and they publish and then they compare. Well, you made a mistake here. The, 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 the other scientist says the, the, um, the method wasn't quite right, or you missed this conclusion, or this equation was wrong, or I can't duplicate this. But um, if we, if, if, if that part gets left out and the scientist makes the proclamation, uh, well, if there's no free free debate, 
then there is uh, no possibility for people to practice science uh, to, because debate require, uh, science requires debate. Autonomy is essential for determining what is rational, not just whatever we're told we should, we should accept by a scientific expert. And if rationality is essential for research, and research is essential for science, then scientism is the antithesis of science. It is a parasite on science. It's a danger that attacks uh, legitimate science and other legitimate forms of knowing. I'm going to repeat that because it's, it's a sort of a strange idea that, we, but that by recommending the authority of an expert over an individual autonomy, right, the individual's right to assess, uh, maybe you have to learn. Maybe I have to learn some ways to understand the scientific method, but there is supposed to be some sort of way of questioning. If the, if, if the autonomy that is essential for determining what is rational is taken away and people are asked to simply believe whatever they're told by an expert, rationality is itself essential for research, and research is essential to science. So scientism is the antithesis of science. But it doesn't always look that way. Right? And, and so, so I'm going to get to progress here in a minute, but I want to just point out a few things here about science. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, grant that the legitimate methods of the individual sciences are very useful and very practical and very brilliant, um, given their variations. Distinguish which science and which which and, and which which method we, which variation of the method are we talking about? But granting that, uh, I, I want to also point out that the method, as I said before, is philosophical we have limits. The philosophy of science, and um, if we're going to talk about actual real science, uh, let's just talk for two minutes or three minutes or five minutes, maybe five, five minutes here on what is real science. Okay, having set aside scientism as not real science. Science, um, again, if we use this sort of bare bones definition of empirical observation based upon. Uh, uh, evidence uh, that can be weighed, hypotheses um, uh, generated based on the evidence and conclusions drawn. Has science always been defined as that? And what is the purpose uh, of the pursuit of science? I want to just introduce an idea without going into detail about it. To say that, uh, that because I want you, I think this, this research is so important, I think it, it deserves much wider um, familiarity for people to exposure. Uh, number one, no. The answer is science as we currently define it is a part of the development of the philosophy of science that is very functional, but it hasn't always been that way, and it hasn't always been that way in the West. Okay? Uh, the work of this, this British, um, as he actually Australian, a thinker named Peter Harrison, oh, you can't really see it here, but it's called The Territories of Science and Religion. And Harrison was the director of the Andreas Idris uh, Professorship of uh, uh, he was the Andreas Idrios Professor of Science and Religion at the University of Oxford up until last year. He's now at the University of Queensland. And Harrison has made a, a very, very, very detailed study of the entire history of what has qualified as science. And he has realized that even in the period when we talk about the scientific revolution, uh, the uh, 17th, 18th, 17th century, 16th, 17th century, that the people who pursued what we call science now were doing something completely different in their minds than what we think they were doing. Okay? Um, and what they thought they were doing, what, what uh, Francis Bacon thought he was doing, what uh, the father of empiricism, of observational uh, uh, science, what Francis Bacon thought he was doing, what Rene Descartes thought he was doing, what Galileo thought he was doing, okay, what the, 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 the founders of the modern, the modern sciences, uh, the different sciences thought they were doing, was pursuing a discipline that was, going to, that was going to help their moral development within. In other words, the discipline of studying God's creation was going to be a moral act that was going to help improve their, that was going to help their moral development and bring them in closer communion with God. Now, for, to hear that, that, that idea that that's what science was for them, they called it natural philosophy. But it was, in some way, in many ways, what we would call natural science. Uh, they thought that they were pr pursuing disciplines that will help their moral development. 
And what's very interesting is that this is a, a very ancient idea as well. That uh, in ancient Greek thought, for example, um, a lot of what, when people observed nature, they thought they were doing was studying uh, the discipline of studying nature and observing nature was going to is, was an ordering process for their for their internal their internal mind and their internal their internal uh, soul. Uh, however, it was conceived even among pagans. So, if the sciences were uh, uh, pursued by people who we never hear about this, this particular interest that they had. Uh, does that mean that they had a theological idea behind their pursuit of science? And Harrison has argued, I think quite persuasively, that they did. And the different, and what they were doing was that Aristotle, I put here on the left, the bottom there, Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, had a particular view of human nature that was um, understood, human beings were understood to, if you pursue certain disciplines, they will make you, they will make you, they will help you develop. Uh, you'll, if you learn what justice is, you'll, become, you'll practice it and you'll become just. But, the, but uh, uh, Augustine, most famously in the West, uh, Augustine uh, was a very, had a very negative view of human nature in some ways. Uh, and Augustine, we know, was the, St. Augustine was the chief uh, intellectual influence in the West uh, in the patristic period, but also uh, even for much later. And St. Augustine had a very different view of human nature. Human nature was, was very broken uh, in, a, in a, you know, the idea of original sin, which the Orthodox and we're very careful with that idea. We believe in ancestral sin, but original sin as a, as a break that is transmitted through the generations. And you get born with this, and baptism doesn't, doesn't it helps, but it, you, we're always, uh, we have this stain. And, and the idea was, for Augustine uh, and others after him, that this affected our physical organs of perception too, our eyesight, our, our strength, and so forth. And so, when we get to, this, to the eight, 17th and 18th century, there was a dispute going on, right, when the modern sciences, astronomy and Galileo and, and, and observational method were being developed, between which view of human nature was right. And the Aristotelian, the ones who believed in Aristotle's uh, model, uh, uh, took a particular path, which I won't get into, but I want to talk about the ones who followed the Augustinian path. And these were, in many ways, Calvin. Calvin's people, Calvinists or people who had Calvinist inclinations, Protestants, who were very Augustinian. In fact, they criticized the Roman Catholic thinkers for being too Aristotelian. And with some legitimacy, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was very influenced by Thomas Aquinas, who was very influenced by Aristotle. So what did the Protestants, uh, who, were in the, in the, uh, the, the, who were involved in early modern science, think they were doing? Well... Evidence suggests that the developer of the microscope, for example, uh, the de developer of the telescope was, of course, a Catholic, a Galileo, but the developer of scientific instruments were developing instruments that would help the broken human perceptions that had been damaged by the fall and would help people to overcome those damaged physical observational abilities to compensate for the fallen nature of humans. And because humans were so fallen, we could only do so much. And what we could do, we could help ourselves a little bit by, by, by developing instruments to help us see more clearly. Because our eyes are, can't see the way the humans saw before the fall. So, what am I getting at here? I'm getting at the fact that the early modern scientists, or people we call the, fathers of the, or the founders of early modern science, thought they were doing something that was inherently theologically centered. They were trying to go through a, a discipline that would help them perfect themselves from within morally. And they were also the developers of what we, I guess we would call the technologies uh, that, that, uh, that helped this uh, process of observation also were based on a very theological idea, the fall. The fall. And when you read the, the, these authors, not in the compendiums that we usually get in, in textbooks, but when you read them themselves, uh, we fi you find that they're talking about this uh, a lot. Okay, so if science, 
sort of bring this down from the clouds a little bit. If science is a, not a single discipline, or a, a, a single thing, even now, or if we should maybe notice that, uh, and those who, pr who created there, who, who were the, the originators of modern science, had theological, some very profound theological uh, understandings of what they were doing. And their goals, even, were interior, had to do with interior virtues. We should be far more uh, wary of anybody who's going to say there is a relationship, especially a conflict or warfare, between science and theology, or science and religion, in Western terms. In Western sense. Okay. Now, um, the qu question of progress. Let, let me see here. I'm flying through this. I want to. I'm taking too long. Okay. Let me go back to, to the idea of progress just very briefly. Okay. Um, the two guys that I mentioned uh, during the talk, uh, Bacon and Descartes, right? The, these uh, people who are seen in many ways as the, the, the founders of the modern method of science, the observational, empirical, well, at least Bacon. Uh, uh, Descartes, not, not, but he's got a different idea of, of modern, uh, a different piece of what he did, what has to do with modern science, particularly mathematical ideas of modern science. Um, if these, these guys, I've already told you, aren't, weren't doing what we say they were doing, didn't think they themselves were pursuing things, uh, their study, in the way we think they were. But even though they were, they were precursors uh, at a kind of point where that idea of the influence of the fall was still very much in their minds. But there was also a shift going on and would go and would continue with people who came after Bacon and Descartes with the idea that science is not about interior virtues anymore, but it's about manipulating, understanding and manipulating the exterior world, the world around us, for the purposes of improving the exterior world. Uh, the, the, the world around us, that we study the external realities of the world to improve the external realities of the world. Right? To, and again, this had a theological uh, element to it initially. This is God's creation. And we're, gonna, we're working to, 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 mess, to, 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 to uh, undo some of the damages in, that we do in creation, or that have happened in creation. But the shift from the, the purposes of what the scientific pursuit was about, from interior to exterior, um, was the beginnings of the idea that science, this method, was going to be able to fix the problems of the external world by this sort of empirical study. And I have the example here of this book, The, the New Atlantis, which was a 1628 utopian novel written by Bacon. And utopianism, right, uh, which Dostoevsky was all too familiar with and lamenting in his own time the dangers of it, the seductive dangers, was, uh, this is an early work we could trace to say that uh, there's, even though Bacon is this sort of figure on two sides of the fence, Bacon would lay some groundwork that would be taken by, by, by successive generations that would say, let's forget about that strange internal idea about uh, moral perfection having to do with science, and let's focus externally on, on fixing the world around us. Okay. So progress, then, with a capital P, is, um, is born in this period. And it implies that the methods of the sciences, this empiricism and so forth, will be applied to the external world. And therefore, the external world can be corrected uh, through uh, human action that has uh, that has developed, or that will be that will be um, uh, developed for the purposes of, of of this sort of this fixing things around us. To put it to kind of now, one last thing I want to say: progress as an idea comes out of the Enlightenment, and in the Enlightenment there was a a shift back to Aristotle's understanding of the human person very optimistic understanding of the human person. The fall, Aristotle knows no fall, right? Aristotle was pre, uh, Aristotle was outside of the, of the uh, Jewish tradition, the Christian, uh, Christian tradition, Christian, uh, the church. So if you uh, see this shift, what you see then is if human beings are, it's an inherently very optimistic view of human uh, possibilities and human, human achievement and human perfectibility, 
through the method of the sciences, through these study, this study and through this observation of nature and through using what we learn to fix the problems that are external to us, what you get is a belief that humans, through scientific observation, can create a world that will go back to or ignore the fall and make a sort of perfection on Earth. That progress is a linear pattern, a linear process, where humans, by using the scientific method and applying it to society, uh, will fix society. Will fix it. Because the idea is society and the external world, whether the physical world or the world of, of the humans, the animals, everything together, work by certain scientific uh, are, are, are mappable in a certain scientific direction. And so there's this incredible uh, kind of utopianism. It's a kind of utopianism. Progress is a utopian idea. That uh, one thing that isn't needed is, is God. For some of the extremists in this period, that God isn't needed for this process. Now, the 19th century and the French Revolution you know, the end of the 18th century, uh, 18th century, but the 19th century. Uh, this is the century when we see the great, greatly damaging and greatly, greatly frightening utopian ideas uh, that are all see themselves as progressive ideas. The utopian ideas that the world can be fixed through human systems applied to the to the circumstances around us and uh, and without a need for God. So these, these methods that started as, as theologically informed methods get divorced from this um, under certain social and political circumstances. Um, and the, all the, the, the meat of the story starts dri uh, dropping off. Now, in, to, to get to the latter, to, to, to sort of move on here and get closer to the end, I want to jump ahead here. And say, I'm going to get rid of this, and I'm going to say that, let's go here, to uh, how does this play out in early 20th century America, late 19th and early 20th century America? Progress, right, with a capital P, and scientism. There is a movement in the eight, starting in the 18, about 1880, 1920s, that is called the, 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 the progressive movement. And the progressive movement, um, some of you may have are familiar with it, but it is a movement that is designed initially, actually, to be um, to be a application of the gospel to um, the external world to help to sort of fulfill the gospel uh, in the external world by Protestants who believed that the world, at the same time, they were Christian, but this, uh, they, they had this idea that the world was perfectible, okay, by human effort. So the progressive movement had some very positive elements to it, but it was a social movement that had a philosophical assumption embedded in it. Number one, humans can create social progress on their own. Yes, there was a uh, practitioners had a there was a social gospel element to some of them, but some of the progressives did not have that. They abandoned this uh, this Christian element of it. Guys like uh, John Dewey and. They took a very different view that, yes, they kept the idea of the optimistic view of, of, of fixing society through, through the, uh, the application of scientific methods, but they got rid of the, the, uh, the, the social gospel element of it. And it became that the application of the scientific method to, to social problems was itself a moral and uh, it's an end in and of itself. Okay? And the the Science, then, the scientific element of this social gospel movement, which then became a kind of a secular movement, the, 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 the uh, science idea was you apply the scientific method to, to solve social problems like poverty and, and, and crime in cities, etc. You study them through the same methods of observation, prediction, and, you know, uh, a prescription for solution. And that, that uh, uh, and, and humans could then optimistically uh, fix society without worrying about the interior element of humans, because uh, if you fix the conditions, then you fix the problems that humans uh, uh, will experience. If you fix the external conditions, you'll get rid of a crime. 
okay, or other human human problems. Uh, this uh, movement uh, is the, I think, the basis for some of what we hear in the modern modern conversation or modern discussions about science and religion, because what we have, what we're left with now, is a a science that is absolutized into a single entity, but is shorn of all of its moral perfectibility elements, and it, in and of itself, if you, you do something as, as science, science in and of itself is somehow achieved a, a level of, it, it is moral by definition, and when it's applied to fix social problems, it itself is moral. And anything that objects to a plan that is supposedly social and moral uh, must be backward and must be anti-scientific. For example, if somebody says, but there's free will, what about that? Well, it's a theological idea. That's, uh, where's the empirical evidence for free will? Well, I don't know. But uh, where's the empirical uh, observation of the quantum, uh, the quanta in quantum physics? Uh, the, the, the demand that everything must be empirical or empirically observable to be, to be legitimate uh, is a demand we hear a lot. But the problem is, even in the sciences, there are things that are not empirically observable and somehow uh, they're legitimate. So uh, the demand, however, to accept the... Uh, the uh, demand to accept this, this... Uh, the idea that if you ask about free will, you're backward or you're unscientific, the demand to accept that is, is part of what is modern scientism. And it is also at the root, in many ways, of modern so-called science-religion conflict. Um, but it's a philosophical demand. Right? Make no mistake. To demand that uh, you should not believe in free will because you can't observe it empirically, that's a philosophical demand. That's a demand to bow down before a, a, a philosophical claim as though it were absolute. That anything, you know, there's a, a saying, absence of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of absence. Right? Absence of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of absence. Just because I cannot measure through empirical methods free will does not mean that I could therefore def uh, unilaterally rule out its existence. If we tried to do this, we're going to be in trouble with a lot of things that human beings know are true and real, uh, but cannot uh, empirically prove, and things that have nothing to do with uh, this is, you know, theological, uh, even theological. Love, yes, there's the this is a very theological thing, but uh, the love of a pet, uh, maybe that's theological, love of creation, but it's not observable. It's a, it still exists. I don't know if anyone would deny that, 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 that that's a real thing. Okay, so um, I'm at the point here now where I want to just point out to you that there are some examples of Orthodox Christians who have come at this, this science, religion, supposed conflict issue from a, from, a very, uh, from a very disciplined perspective where these guys are scientists, all of them I've listed here. Uh, one of them is a Roman Catholic, actually. But... And, but have had realized there is absolutely no reason to demand, to jam all reality into this uh, methodology of science in order to, to see value in it. Michael Pupin is a Serbian, was a Serbian Orthodox, uh, was a Serbian Orthodox um, physicist who died in 1935. And um, I have his obituary here that I will show you at the end if you want to see it, but we we're short on time, so I'm not going to show it to you, but his description because there was a quote about an interview with Pupin before he died, about within the month, about well, how does he, you know, believe in God? Uh, and uh, he was, you know, he worked his whole life in America, and it's uh, it's so clear that he could see he was a faithful Orthodox that he could see the difference between what he was doing in the lo in the laboratory as very valuable, but very much only part of the story of of, of reality. Um, Georges Lemaitre is the, the, the a, a Jesuit, a Belgian priest who was the developer of the Big Bang Theory, which when it was announced was seen as a great and wonderful evidence for the, the story, for the Christian story of creation out of nothing. Uh, 
the Big Bang has been, has been I think, uh, stolen by atheists, uh, by so-called scientific atheists who say, well, but this is evidence of a chemical explosion that started the universe and not God. But that's, the, first of all, well, the question is, well, where did those chemicals come from? And the process. But let's leave that aside for a minute. When it was, when the idea came out, if you read newspapers and if you read the accounts at the time by the person who just developed it, uh, and Einstein didn't even know if this was real in the beginning, but but uh, but Lemaitre showed him, Lemaitre showed him ev through evidence that this is the case, as far as he could tell. Um, the the idea is well, no, the, the, it's a pagan idea to say that you, the matter is eternal. That just got, you know that matter has always been. This is this is a theological vision that's profoundly Christian, according to the person who founded that, who, who uncovered this idea, or who who theorized about this idea. Well, okay, uh, that's something to take into account. Uh, Dobzhansky was a th evolutionary a biologist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, Russian Orthodox in America. Um, he did venture in some ways to talk about this theology. But he saw no conflict. His results, the results of what he said and his conclusions uh, are debatable, but um, he did not see a conflict, for sure. And then I'm going to give you uh, one or two other examples. Archbishop uh, St. Luke of Simferopol in Crimea. I don't know if you're uh, maybe very familiar with him, maybe not. I don't know. But uh, there's, uh, there are churches in the Church Abroad and elsewhere dedicated to St. Luke. St. Luke was a physician during the Soviet era, an archbishop. And... Uh, he wrote about science and religion. He wrote a piece called Science and Religion. And uh, he, very, he was a, he was a, a trained uh, surgeon. He was, in fact, extraordinarily prominent surgeon. Um, and he did basic research as well. He wrote a, some books that were, that, were, that were standards of their time. The Soviet government was forced to give him medals as a scientist while being embarrassed the fact that he was with a believer. They said, this is incomp incompatible. But he was the one who was doing the science that, ah, not at all. So, and these, these are people in the 20th century. And then there are others. There are modern thinkers who have written about um, science and religion from an orthodox perspective, the, from a historical perspective, from a theological perspective, who have come up with some interesting ideas. And if you want to talk to me later, I can refer you to some of these books. But, okay, so that's my, my uh, kind of freewheeling presentation on this, uh, the story of progress and the story of science and scientism. I thought maybe we'd conclude by, by looking, doing a little mini test, uh, case study, to see uh, if we can spot um, some of the things we're talking about today at work, if we can spot it. In 2010, uh, Stephen Hawking, who you may recognize uh, there, he's a professor of applied maths and theoretical, oops, I spelled theoretical wrong. That I think the, I'll blame the computer for that. Professor of Applied Mass and Theoretical Physics at Cambridge, University of Cambridge in the UK. Very famous public figure. He, he has, uh, you can't see here, but he, he has the uh, 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 amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, and he's been wheelchair bound for many years. Uh, Hawking is famous for, uh, as a public scientist, he's written many books, best selling books, and, his, and uh, in his books that he was writing in the 1990s, uh, he had a very diffuse idea of God. Uh, very, it's not a personal God, but it's still he believed in some sort of spiritual reality behind the whole the whole process that we see in the in the world and in um, in the physical the world of physics. And he spoke in one of his books about well, if we learn this, we'll know the mind of God. Okay, well, it's kind of arrogant uh, human human arrogance uh, getting the better of him there where he says that if we use the scientific method, we can know the mind of God and understand how creation happened. But, leaving all that aside, in recently he has turned in another direction and has, and has said uh, this. In 2010, in a book he co-authored, and there was a story, a TV show on the, uh, the Learning Channel that were, it was all about this claim he made, and here it is. It says, because there is such a law of gravity, you can read it, but I'll read it to you too. Because there is such a law, as gra a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. Okay, that was Hawking in a book 
with a guy, a California physicist named Leonard Laudano, co-authored. This is a high priest of science uh, in the modern world. Um, he is in the most mysterious of the sciences, the most difficult uh, to pin down what it really is and how it really works, the theoretical physics. Uh, and uh, he is a very uh, famous and popular figure. He's even appeared in the Simpsons cartoon. And if you've gone and made, made it there, you've certainly made it in, in uh, modern uh, popular culture. To whatever extent, uh, I hope I don't see myself there. I guess it's not still going on. I don't aspire to that. But um, what's the wrong with this uh, claim? Uh, what, is this a scientific claim? Or is this a claim that is philosophy masked as science? Is this uh, a, an empirically demonstrable statement? Well, what do you think? There, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe will create itself from nothing. So the law of gravity, a physical, a physical law, we understand this process, gravity will, somehow physically, the physical force of gravity, will create the universe from nothing. Gravity, of course, is a, is a, is a scientific idea that, is, that has limits to it, right? Gravity is something. Gravity is not everything. But gravity, this force, which is a particular constrained thing, it does not, it's not, gravity isn't everything. I mean, gravity is holding the water down, but gravity isn't, this is not gravity. It doesn't taste like it, at least, I don't know, I've never compared it to what gravity tastes like, but it doesn't seem like gravity, it seems more like water to me. Gravity is the force that will create the universe from nothing. And then he says this other statement, spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Spontaneous creation, mean, meaning, I don't know, do you say, spontaneous meaning it just happens, but for Who's running it? Who, who's doing the creating? Well, there's no who. It's only what, right? It's this rabbit. What's going on here? Well, what's going on here is he's substituting uh, a philosophical claim. Well, I guess the philosophical claim would be, in the beginning there was gravity. <laughs> and the gravity was with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And gravity was... Well, maybe he believes that. Maybe. I, he has a right to believe it if he wants. I guess, right? But I don't believe it. I don't think you have to believe it. And I don't think this is an empirical observation that is testable uh, and comparable by other people who pursue empirical observations. So what this is is a theological statement but when it's made by a theoretical physic, physicist, it somehow seems oh, scientific. And by the way, when it, is, it must be, it seems very scientific. Right? Well, it's not science. It's scientism. This is, this is clear scientism. Uh, he, he arrogates to the, the, the method, uh, the scientific method, the right to talk about creation itself, which, of course, can be observed. But he even com comes up with a, 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 an active principle which somehow, I guess, where did that come from? Where, where, right? where, did, this, where did gravity come from? It had to precede creation, right? See, see, this is a circular argument. It's very, very circular. It's so circular that I think a child could see it. But we have trouble sometimes seeing it. Because we don't look at it through the eyes of <gasps> a child. We look at it through the eyes of... Oh, this is, this, uh, Authority, maybe not everyone here, but 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 certainly culturally, you know, this get made a book, uh, it was on a TV show, instead of somebody saying, "What? I I don't think so." No, try talking about some th some physics, but not not this, right? So again, maybe maybe you, you maybe you. Uh, I don't know. What, 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 I guess I'd like to open it up at the end for questions and what you think about this. I have another case study we could talk about that appeared in the New York Times by a biologist uh, lecturing his students on why biology has 
has sort of made the, 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 no room left for, for belief in anything beyond the physical world. But I think you get the point, and maybe you've read these things on your own. So my plea to you at the end is, um, and then we can have questions, my plea to you in the end is, when, you, when, when, when we talk to, uh, whether it's we ourselves, or whether we're speaking to somebody from the perspective of, who comes to us and says science and religion uh, are in conflict, um, even if we want to talk exclusively on Western terms, right? I didn't say much about Orthodox theology. I don't think I have to do that here. But you, you, but we know that the theology in the, in the Eastern Church, of course, is something very different. There's one who's a theologian who prays and one who prays is theologian, right? Uh, theology is a noetic experience in the Orthodox Church. But in, but in the West, a theology is a kind of a, you know, must be a, a scholastic sort of pr a practice. But even that theology, uh, cannot be said to conflict with um, the other set of disciplines, the other set of rules that are called the sciences. Um, uh, so, yeah, you know, my, my plea is to, to, when we speak to people, when we look, to say, well, wait a second here. You say science does this and science demonstrates that. Which science do you mean? What are the rules here? And, uh, and uh, maybe you're making philosophical claims and not so much scientific claims. Maybe we should talk about that. Um, okay. That's that's all. <laughs> Thank you.